We're digging in some specific offensive guys. We're, j we're digging into today, John Birdie and Garrett Cooper. Should they be starters? Should they be bench guys? What do the numbers tell us? Myself and Sean Barrett are going to dig into everything on today's Locked On Marlins. You are Locked On Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings from England and welcome to our Daily Marlins podcast with me, Peter Pratt. Don't forget to follow me, guys, on Twitter at Miami Marlins underscore UK. If you are listening, hit subscribe. Pod is available everywhere and free. Hit subscribe. They drop onto your device immediately. If you are watching, yes, you will know there's a YouTube channel. If you aren't and you are listening, yes, there's a YouTube channel. Find us. It's Locked on Marlins. Content is available everywhere. Thanks for making Lockdown Marlins your first listen of the day, and welcome to the Wednesday episode. As you can see, Sean Barrett is back. Absolute UK goat. Sean, how are we doing? Not too bad, Pete. Deep dive into numbers. You knew I couldn't keep away. Mate, I, I had the fishing rod out there with that one. The bait was on, on the hook. I knew. I said, Sean, I've, I really need someone to do a deep dive on some numbers here, some offensive numbers. Do you know anyone? <laughs> Sean literally within four minutes says I'm ready to go already. So that's that's what we're working with. We're going to dig into two guys just on this episode, guys. It's going to be a deep dive as such, statistically, on John Birdie and Garrett Cooper with an ad squeezed in between. I actually can't remember who the ad is yet. So that's a problem that I need to look at. Maybe there's two ads. So that's another problem. But nevertheless, I'll work that out. And there is two ads as well. Bloody hell. <laughs> dear, oh dear. My plan has fell at the planning stage. Nevertheless, we'll keep it rolling. Sean, the question I've got, let's start with John Birdie. Because for me, Birdie, I mean, big year in some ways. He ends up being the stolen base king in 41 stolen bags in four, just over 400 plate appearances. So, Listen, if you project that outwards and he plays the whole year and plays every day, I mean, he's, what's it, 60 bags, 65 bags? Absolutely wild for John Birdie. As we go into this offseason, the question that's kind of in my mind around Birdie and actually the majority of the roster is a starter. Should he be a starter? And how does he perhaps compare to maybe some other starters? But... Overall, let's kind of start asking that question around Birdie. Piecing together his numbers, his production, his value, and starting to work out from a Marlins perspective, should we be relying on John Birdie to be a starter? Um, whether that is, you know, whether there's a position allocated to John Birdie, I don't think you need to. The versatility is there, utility king. But sure, let's start with that kind of overarching question. How what do you right now as we kind of head to the offseason? The Marlins have an arbitration decision to make on him. I think his projected number is like 2.4, 2.5 million. To me, feels like decent value. But taking the money aside, how are you feeling about Birdie at this stage? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question in the sense of you've you put it the right way. Is does he deserve to be in a starting lineup? Because it's not a case of is you, you lock him in, he's going to get you 500 at bats at third base or at second base. It's not like that. He's got that defensive. Yeah. You know, ability so it is a case of does he deserve to get that 500 550 at bats and ultimately i think i think the answer is is frankly no i think oh he is the prototypical 350 400 at bats exactly what we got out of him more or less this year guy off the bench now 2.6 for 99% of baseball teams for a bench bat is pretty much what they're happy to spend. Marlins, yeah. Yeah, wait and see. I think you, you look at the numbers and everything about him, he's one of these sort of ho-hum guys in the sense of that they don't change much. They just do what they always do. All the, all the numbers you want to look at, whether that's you know the line drive, ground ball, fly ball rate, 
whether that's the you know hitting to all fields. Those numbers are pretty much pretty standard for his whole career. His walk rate and his K rates, his ISO, all those kind of things. Those numbers stay very familiar all the way through his career. And okay. I remember talking to you probably mm-hmm. last off season, and then the idea of he had a fantastic year in 2020 and had a massive OBP as well. Uh, not OBP, sorry, uh, a high Babbitt. Then last mm-hmm. year fell off a cliff because of Babbitt. And this year was kind of more of the same because it's not two years, it's the first half, second half. So most of his numbers, most of the numbers that I look at to try and drive from where things are coming from don't change between the first half and the second half. The only change is in the first half, he had a 3.69 BABIP, and in the second half, he had a 2.65 BABIP. So that's over a 100-point swing in BABIP. Wow. And that's where all of his value went for me. So in the first half, he had a 115 OBP. In the second half, it was in the 70s. So I think once you balance that all out and you look at a player with a 93 BABIP, uh, a WRC plus, sorry, he is just under league average. Now, mm. we've talked a lot about having Marlins bats be just about under league average. <laughs> and defensively, you can put up with that if you've got a guy that is a glove first guy. Now, Bertie can play everywhere, but mm. he's not what I would call a stud fielder at any of those positions. He can play no. them at a just below to league average position. So he is, yeah, he is a major league bench bat who has at times this year been forced into a starting role. Um, and just one last thing on him because it's been on my mind for a while, even when the season, even when there were games happening. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> John Morton, most of the season played in the leadoff spot. He, and to me, that's a massive mistake because his on-base percentage while in the leadoff spot was in the bottom six of the 27 players who had 250 at-bats in the leadoff spot. He had a Babbitt, uh, an on-base percentage below 300. In your leadoff spot, you have one job, and that's to get on base. Now, if you've got yep. some speed to steal the base later on, fantastic. But mm. I would rather have a guy that can get on base 360, 380, you know, or 36% of the time, 38% of the time over, with no speed. Uh, Brandon Nimmo, if you like. And that's not the first time you're going to hear his name out of my mouth this year. Rather than a guy that can't get on base but can steal second when he gets on base. I think we mm. talked a lot about the idea that the Marlins sometimes lack identity in the idea mm. of having a cleanup here, having a lead-off guy, having a, yeah. a prototypical guy that can hit second, you know, that guy that can knock in the, the lead-off guy. So I think Bertie overall for me is a bench bat that brings defensive versatility, speed, mm. um, and very little else. When he is starting in games, I want to see him hitting in the eight nine role. That mm. false that false lead off here at nine. That's his yeah. perfect spot in my eyes. Just how valuable are forty one stolen bases in the grand scheme? Like if if you are basically just a base dealer. Give or take, like there's a lot, like that's being doing a little bit of disservice to Birdie, but nevertheless, let's just kind of strip it back and go. Listen, 41 stolen bags, there's a lot of stolen bags. There's a lot of times you've got on base or hit a single, and you've effectively created a double out of that. And sometimes you steal in third, and obviously back in 2020, he was stealing home once, um, in the most unconventional manner. Nevertheless, how valuable is that in the grand scheme? Because, like, I it feels like a lot. It feels valuable. But are we overvaluing a stolen base these days? I don't know. And to a certain degree, people are. But in this sense, because he stole so many bases and, and his court stealing was low, you know, that that has a value um, that I won't go into sabermetrically because it's dry as hell. But <laughs> just think about even for the manager's sake, You've got a guy that ultimately, at a certain period of time when he was going for the record, 
in the month of, you know, against Mike. He was made aware of it by, I think it was the fish stripes guys. And then all of a sudden, every time he was on first base, he was stealing no matter what. It got to the point where the opposing teams must have known he was going to steal yeah. every time he got on first. And yeah, they yeah. still couldn't get him out. That has an absolute value. I mean, if you think about a close game, seventh, eighth inning, you want to bring you want to bring in Bertie in a pinch running situation. Let's say Coop gets a single, you're putting Coop straight away to put Bertie in because you know for sure you've got a guaranteed stolen base. You're basically you could at any point in a game turn a single into a double, yeah. and that again has a, a sabermetric value, and that you know as a for a manager that having that asset and that is an asset. Even if you want to just strip him down, which, as you said, is unfair, strip him down to a guy that can steal bases when we need them to. That has a value for sure when you're trying to manage a game. If you, uh, and I may kind of catch you on the hop here, but let's let's say the Marlins decide, you know what? John Birdie, we're going to lock him in. He's going to play every day at second base. John Birdie sitting the nine spot. We're going to slide Jazz to shortstop because we think that perhaps Birdie offers more offensive value than Miggy Rowe at shortstop. I know Miggy offers defensive value, but how how do they back Miggy's offensive production? <coughs> excuse me, felt light obviously in 22 it didn't just feel like it was light but how much would they lose defensively by taking miggy out of the the shortstop role versus how much they would gain perhaps by having birdie hitting nine and offering 40 to 50 stolen bags at second base and then jazz sliding over if that makes sense yeah, I'll start my answer by saying not only are you you losing Miggy at shortstop and the defensive prowess that he has there, but you're also putting Jazz in at shortstop, and that's an issue for me defensively as well. So okay. Jazz is a better Jazz is a better second baseman, or well, at least he was in limited time this year than Bertie. So you're losing twice. Um, additionally. I don't think that Bertie's bat. Let's 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 strip away the stolen bases for now. The bat alone, there's not much difference between Bertie and and Miguel Rojas. In fact, I would say that Mickey actually has a little bit more in the way of batting average potential mm-hmm. or history. Let's say he had a bad year this year. There yeah. was some. There was a free. It's such a shame that because first half, second half numbers, you can find them anywhere. But if you want to look at uh, Miggy and look at the three-month window of May, June, July, he was actually a really serviceable bat during that time. Uh, over 100 WRC+. plus. You know, he was hitting 290, I think it was. He had spurts. Well, not even spurts. He had periods of time, large periods of times, where he was a good bat. Unfortunately, the April was atrocious. And the September was wasn't great either, so the actual numbers get mm. skewed. Um, okay. But no, it, to to answer your question, I would far rather see Jazz playing good defense, not not great defense, but good defense at second base, and yep. see Miggy playing elite defense at shortstop, rather than seeing Jazz struggle massively at shortstop, and see Bertie's speed added to the lineup. Bertie, I still think, is mm-hmm. best penciled in as a bench bat. Yeah. Seems fair. Have we seen... Is there anything to suggest that we haven't seen the best of Birdie thus far? Or is he now, with the sample that we have, do we anticipate that this is who he is now and we we have a decent understanding? Like, is there is there some untapped offensive production in John Birdie, do you think? Uh, as as far as at bat, no, he is what he is. He's his as I said, his numbers are very vanilla in the sense that they're just always the same. The only difference we've seen this year, as far as I'm concerned, is a a, a lack of abandon as far as stealing bases. He was just running 
whenever we could. Um, so the fact that he never stole 20 bags in, in a season and they're all of a sudden over 40, I think the only potential increase in value that you can get from Bertie, and let's not forget next year he'll be 33, so he's no spring chicken. The only improvement we can see is if he can successfully continue to steal bases at the rate because it's not just how many bags you steal, it's how successful you are. Yeah. But if if he gets 400 plate appearances, so if he gets the same playing time next year as he did this year, I think you could expect that number to hit 50 because I think he's kind of got that green light now in his own head of they can't stop me, so I'm running at every opportunity. Why why does Birdie have more success than Jazz Chisholm stealing bases? It's something that slightly puzzles me. Just when you kind of and everything that goes into it, a little bit confused as to why Birdie seemingly is a is a far greater base stealer than Jazz Chisholm Jr. Is there anything that you can point towards there, or is it just... Uh, I, well, I don't know. I mean, is it just the, the ability to... To know when to go? Is Jazz tipping his hand? Or is Jazz too hesitant? I don't know. Maybe that, that won't come out the numbers. But what's your sense of that one? Um, I think to a certain degree, I mean, it's, it's not just speed, is it? It is base running skills. Now you have, because you do like to throw these things at me, got me running to Baseball <laughs> Savant. Um, and they have a nigh-on identical 29.6 for Bertie. 29.2 foot per second speed. So they're basically the same speed. Okay. Um, so ultimately... Which for some reason, like that, that's that's an even interesting in itself. The perception is Jazz is faster than Birdie. I don't know why, but actually, I mean, everything tells us that Birdie probably is quicker than Jazz because his base stealing prowess and success is far greater than Jazz Chisholm. But maybe we just get you know, we we get uh, the over lenses when we see Jazz sliding in and there's all sorts going on. His helmet's flying off. Birdie slides in, picks up his socks and goes, hey, let's go. I'm going to take third now as well. <laughs> kind of look a bit different, but I interrupted I mean, you. Sorry. Baseball. What's on, baseball? On the base pass, he's never going to have a more stylish steal than when he stole home, is he? So no, he's, it's, he's it's all, unmatched. He's all business now. I think it is a case of yeah, you're not just it's not just pure speed. You're you're running on the catcher mm. and his arm, and you're running on the pitcher and and his his movement, his release. There's there's a lot more to stealing bases than just speed, and it could just be a case that Bertie it, Bertie steals when he knows he can steal. Jazz, we've seen. I don't think you're right. We've seen that drama, haven't we? Where he's overslid the bag here and there. Yeah. And everything. So it isn't just pure speed it is the ability to steal bases and jazz is still young he's still developing and you know there were some improvements that he made this year on last year and i expect to see some improvements again hopefully you would as he develops and i think if the marlins bring in a more sabermetrically inclined manager or a more inclined approach as an organization you would look at jazz's uh, caught stolen to stolen base rate and say that's a concern. Jazz needs to steal bases at a more successful clip to continue to get the green light, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, speaking of speed and pace, um, we've completely botched the timings of this episode. I have to call it out right now, so I apologise. We're running long already, and we may have to slightly divert away. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do one ad and then we're going to have to, I wanted to briefly follow up on jazz. I'm going to park Gary Cooper. And we're going to do a full episode on Coop next time around. So that's what we're going to do. So for those that were thinking about Coop, you can just dwell on it even more. Think about it for next time. The question coming to you, Sean is, uh, and I'll let you dwell on this too, while we get into the first ad is knowing what we know about jazz and the base stealing success or lack thereof at times where does his optimal spot in the lineup become and should perhaps Jazz Chisholm be running less in 22 and further down the order to maximise some of his other... I'll let you dwell on that. 
I want to let you know about our good friends over at Rhone. And remember, remember, we strive, we strive to bring you quality. Quality, yes. And the dress shirt, it was due for a radical reinvention. And Rhone stepped up to the challenge. Rhone's commuter shirt is the most comfortable, breathable and flexible shirt known to man. And here's why. Mobility. Yes. Jacob Stalin's mobility is everything. <laughs> Rome's comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work to 18 holes of golf or 36. Looking good is easy and it's time to feel confident with a wrinkle-free shirt without the hassle. With Rome's wrinkle release technology, wrinkle as you stretch and wear the shirt, it's that Easy, it really is. So, the commuter shirt can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. You can head to Roan.com. Roan is spelled R H O N E. So, Roan.com slash locked on. Use your promo code locked on to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20 to 0. Whole percent off your entire order at Roan.com slash locked on. Reminder, the promo code, yes, it is locked on. And it's time to find your corner office comfort. Okay. Sean Barrett. Jazz Chisholm. Should he be still should he be hitting in the in, in the leadoff spot? Um, we weren't supposed to talk about jazz, but we've kind of segued into him. So I'm keen to get you. We recall, let's not remember, let's not forget, sorry. Jazz was in the nine hole to start the year, and everyone was throwing their arms up. Jazz should be, he's the obvious leadoff candidate. Is he, is the question. <laughs> no, <laughs> not in my mind. <laughs> the um, the on-base percentage just isn't there. Um, I've already mentioned he's young, and I've always, I've, I'm, I'm not down on Jazz. I'm just, I can see the obvious warts in his, in his makeup. Um, mm. at the plate, you know, he, he is a guy that has improved. The walk rate's gone up, K rate's come down ever so slightly. I just don't see a lead off hitter there. I mean, he's got the tools, don't get me wrong. And and, and you, as you said, he's got that kind of swag and he's kind of got that that attitude that he deserves a premier spot, especially on this team, deserves a premier spot in the lineup. I just don't see it as the, the leadoff guy, I'd much rather see him in the cleanup spot. I think he is a middle of the order power bat. Now, I've already spoke about his lack of success to a degree at stealing bases um, and, and the, the value that that isn't bringing to the team. Not to mention, we're talking about a player that has struggled to stay on the field. There is that injury concern. Now, in my mind, the quickest way for a player to get themselves injured is stealing bases. I'd mm. much rather see Jazz hit 30 home runs and steal 10 bags at a more efficient clip than see him hit 2020. I know that's got some swagger with that 2020 number, and I'm sure Jazz actually thinks 30 30 is in, in the realms of possibility. And I, I'm not going to say it's not because he's a young guy and he's clearly motivated to be a star but i would much rather see him with with his skills with the power especially what we saw this year mm. that power output the fact that he you know we're talking an 850 ops you know that is that's a pretty decent young middle of the order power bat in my eyes let's let's stop worrying about stolen bases we don't need that from him yeah the question leads us then to who should be leading off for the match? Like Birdie, no. Jazz, no. Um, is the right leadoff hitter on the roster right now? And let's not forget, Soler was leading off too. But I look at Soler's OBP. That was sub 300 too. So Soler's not the answer. I mean, Soler shouldn't be leading off. I don't know what that was. That was like trying to create Aaron Judge and get it you know, wildly wrong. No. Birdie, no. Where, where, would, where should the Marlins turn here? Well, if you look at what you need from a leadoff guy, because most of the time, yeah, they've got some speed. 
Marlon's need a centre fielder. We've known that for, for years, quite literally. There are a few very nice centre field lead off hitting guys, Brandon Nimmo. I'm, I might, I'm genuinely might bring him into every single podcast because that's how <laughs> interested I am in the Marlins going to acquire him. Yeah. But yeah, I think the the starting centre fielder is not inside the organisation, and the starting lead off hitter also isn't in the organisation. Mm. They can fill both of those holes with just one guy. Yeah, agreed. Um... Okay, so swag and studs, because you were talking about Jazz Chisholm. It's time to let you know about our good friends over at Bilba. And if you haven't tried their puffs yet, you are depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor in town. It is delicious, indulgent cookie dough. It's covered in chocolate. That's right, Bilt has done it again. Let me introduce you to your new favorite. It is cookie dough chunk puff. And they have a light and chewy texture, real chunks. And of course, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. All the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it. Plus, the cookie dough chunk puffs are only 160 calories. And they have a whopping 15 calories. 15 calories? 15 making up words. So, if you like what you're hearing, guys, get yourselves over to Built Dog, the promo code locked on 15 and it gets 15% off your order. One five, 15% off your order. Reminder on the promo code, locked on 15. Just about managed to get this show back on track. It was tough, but we're there. Um, I'm with you though on the center fielder, mate. I mean, it makes a ton of sense. Like this lead off spot, the center fielder hole, they go hand in hand. Birdie, Miggy, Jazz, pretty much any of the guys, no one is the prototypical leadoff guy right now. And I think it's something that the Marlins do need to address. Birdie, when he plays, in whatever role he plays at times, get him in the ninth spot. Jazz, let's get him down the order. Let's get him down there where he can do damage with that stick. You know, that, that lefty power stick in the, you know, three, four, five hole, depending on matchups and computers and everything else makes a ton of sense. Less stolen bags, less injuries, stay healthy. Bombs are better than bags. That's what I'm going to say for Jazz Chisholm. Um, the question then comes, I mean, you've I mean, mentioned in what, five episodes in a row, I think it is now. So it's, you know, there's, there's a few other candidates too that I think we'll probably dig in as we last year's episodes work out who were the center field targets and they pretty much Nimmo I remember talking about him last time around because you know the Mets had signed Marte what does this mean for Nimmo um actually they shunted Marte out to uh to right field prioritize Nimmo at center field so we have a ready built center fielder replacement actually in-house which is Starling Marte and maybe go and get a, a power stick I don't know Sean we're gonna leave it there because both me and you have got man flu. We're day to day, but we have rattled off three episodes on the spin in on a Monday evening. Even though this is Wednesday's episode, it's all being recorded. Um, it's being recorded on a Monday. So, guys, thanks for making Locked On Marlins your first listen of the day on Wednesday. I hope you've enjoyed the deep dive on John Birdie because that was fun. That was fun. I think really, as we go through these, and we are going to go through them, we're going to start a piece together where the optimal Marlins lineup look what it looks like and equally what are the holes that need to be filled and i think we've already found out we don't have the lead off hitter in the organization right now we know we don't have a center fielder now so that's the next step is how do we fill that gap brandon nimmo i think is sean's shout uh sean out of interest what was brandon nimmo's uh obp this year you may not have that <laughs> it was uh, yeah it was 368 this year mm. um but he is a career 385 obp oh. player Oh my days! It's it's worlds apart from from what the Marlins um, have got. For, well, yeah, I don't think there's a single guy over three fifty on the Marlins at the moment. No, that's what we need. That if we're gonna push it on, let's let's get the top of the order sorted. The bottom of the order with some of these other clubs, you can mix and match. But let's try and get the top of the order absolutely humming. Let's get the leadoff guy on. 
Let's get some gap hitters coming then, and let's get some thump going after that. It kind of makes sense, but we'll get into that. We're going to next episode, we're going to cover Garrett Cooper in depth. It's going to be because it's Sean's favorite guy. Um, but we'll see. We'll see if we can squeeze it into one. Nevertheless, thanks for making Lockdown Marlins your first listener of the day. Thank you for joining us on Wednesday. I'll be back on Thursday. Until then, see you tomorrow.